I'm Julia J. Gibbs. I'm really glad that y'all are joining us today. I have my great friends here, Brian and Wendy Ferguson, that Brian and I were great friends in college. And um, we had a really fun group of friends that we would hang out with. And Brian, you were the um, praise and worship leader at church for us, right? I was, yes. Super talented, has an amazing voice and can play Journey like no one else, if I remember right. <laughs> I that. Yes. Yeah, you're good at that. You're good at that. So today we are talking with Brian and Wendy and we are getting into a conversation that I'm going to be honest. I don't think people have a lot. And I think that we should be having more. We are going to be talking about a marriage issue that a lot of people actually are struggling through. And so many people feel like they're struggling through this issue in the dark in secret. They have to close their doors and deal with it all alone. And they go to church every Sunday and they don't know what to do with what's happening at their house. So we are, of course, going to be talking about um, vulnerability, obedience to the Lord and dealing with same sex attraction within the marriage um, covenant. So the issue of same sex attraction is not going away. It's not something that the church is going to be able to just say, we're just not going to deal with that until it goes away. It is a part of our culture and it's becoming more and more of a conversation piece that the church really needs to be a part of. And so we're going to be talking today about trying to re-engage in this conversation and talking to Wendy and talking to Brian and their life experiences of walking with the Lord and get struggling through these issues and what they can teach us about how we, the church, can better grow, better engage, and better listen and better disciple with people as they are struggling with this issue. So Brian, I want to start with you. I want to ask you to just simply, can you start by sharing your story and your journey of um, dealing with same-sex attraction and your wonderful and beautiful wife, Wendy, will also talk to us. But I'd love to start with you and just let you share your heart with us. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Julia, for, uh, for giving us this opportunity. You know, if you'd have told me years ago, back when we were hanging out in college, if I'd be sitting here with my wife having this conversation... <laughs> Yes. Uh, or social media, I would have said, you, well, you're crazy. <laughs> you didn't even know this story back then. So, but, um, you know, just to give a little bit of perspective on, on my life journey, the way things have been, I was born and raised here in Mobile, Alabama. So the good South, the Bible Belt, which I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of my heritage, uh, raised in a good Christian family uh, in church. And so I, I gave my heart to Jesus at the age of 11. So I followed Jesus and, and I have been in love with Jesus ever since. So, but the hard thing to me though, is, is about that time, 12, 13 years old, when, you know, if you'd have looked at me back then, you said, Brian's just a, a normal little kid. You know, I had my friends, things like that. We played in the neighborhood. But as my friends, as all my guy friends kind of started noticing girls, Mm -hmm. I wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was noticing other guys and that's, that's even hard to say right now, yeah. but it was just the truth. And it wasn't something that like, I woke up one day and said, I, I, I want this. I want to be this way. It just right. wasn't that way. It just happened. It happened on its own. And, um, and I think that's the way just in talking with so many people that seems to be the way it happens. My, my other guy friends didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to start liking girls. Right. Just, and so, but as a Christian, that was, you know, I held to a biblical conservative view of marriage and sexuality. Mm. Um, marriage is, is intended, I believe, and I still believe to this day, I believe the Bible very much supports this, that marriage is intended to be between a man and a woman, two sexually different people, mm -hmm. and sex belongs within a marriage. And so mm. me having desires outside of that and attractions outside of that, it was very incongruent with my faith. Mm -hmm. And being in the South, for anybody that's in the South, uh, and particularly 30 years ago, so I'm 40, right. almost 43. So this was 30 something years ago. Mm -hmm. you 
talk about that. Um, and so all I'd really seen when I when I looked at church, you know, people in my church, which I love my church, but the only message and the only voice that I had heard from the church was um, people being made fun of, condemned, right. going straight to hell. That mm-hmm. was what I heard. And my friends made fun of people like that. So I prayed and I prayed, God, change me. I just mm-hmm. be like my friends, but nothing was changing. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I, I didn't understand all of this, but one thing I knew for sure is that nobody could ever find out about my secret. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, through the years, you know, I was probably one of the, like the golden boy of the youth group. I, I went to the altar, I led worship. I went to youth convention, youth camps. I prayed, I read my Bible. I did all the things that a good Christian boy is supposed to do, but things were not changing in my life. And the more years that went by, I remember year after year thinking, you know, my new year's resolutions, you know, Mm -hmm. every year when it struck midnight, which I didn't very often stay up till midnight. You remember that? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But but on new year's, my resolutions was, this is going to be the year. This is going to be the year that things are going to change in my life. A year on and this secret continues Mm -hmm. to get bigger and bigger and in an environment where you feel like you can't talk about, you've got this big thing in your life where everybody else thinks everything's perfect in life, but you got this big secret. Shame really begins to become a very big element. And, and it's not a shame of uh, necessarily of, oh, I feel bad because I did something wrong. It's a shame of a toxic shame. I feel bad because of who I am. Mm, wow. a toxic, toxic environment. Mm-hmm. So, but years went on, years went on, and I uh, I met Wendy. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, the college years, we all hung out, things like that. But I met Wendy, and I fell in love with Wendy. And, yeah. You know, it, it, it may have been a little different than maybe my friends falling in love with their, um, their the person they were going to marry. But I knew that I loved her. I knew that I wanted to marry her. I knew I wanted to be with her for the rest of my life. And so we started dating and we actually were really good friends for several years before then. So we knew each other very well. She didn't know my secret. Mm. And, um, there were times like I wanted to tell her, but I was so hesitant because, again, this was just this very closely guarded secret in my life. And mm-hmm. I should have told her, but I didn't. Mm. And so my my assumption was uh, is that, you know, I loved her. I wanted to marry her. And I really thought, OK, this is the thing. When I get married, this is going to go away and everything's going to be great. Right. So we got married. And in a lot of ways, in most ways, our marriage was very, very good, very strong, because we've always like we're not the type of couple that on the weekends wants to part ways and like me go off with the guys and stuff. I mean, we just loved being with each other, had a great, healthy relationship in so many ways. Mm-hmm. But still this big secret, you know, mm-hmm. and so years and years go on. And, and uh, we had two, we have two, two boys, Jay, yeah. and Noah, 12 and 10 years old. In so many ways, our life probably looked very good from the outside in. Right. But really began getting into a point of, of being very, very depressed on the inside. I just always, always felt a sense of such shame. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I got to a point times that I felt so hopeless, like, God, I've been praying for five, 10, 20 years now, God, that this would go away. My own wife, who I love so much, doesn't know. Mm. What if she did? How is it going to break her? How is this going to impact her? And what if everybody else knows? They think I'm this good Christian boy, uh, but how are they going to think of me? What are people going to think if they know what's really happening inside of me? Right. But finally, so I just got to a point, there were even moments where I I even considered taking my own life because it seemed like that was the only way out of this. Mm-hmm. I was so hopeless. Mm-hmm. But I remember and the, at the beginning of 2016, mm-hmm. God began dealing with my heart and just, just speaking to me. Um, I'm not saying verbally, but I knew what he was saying is, Brian, you need to open up about this. Yeah. And you need to open up to Wendy. And uh, 
At first, mm -hmm. no, God, no, there's no way. But I kept coming across. I mean, I'd be driving down the road and see a billboard that said something like, don't hide. Nothing, you know, or I'd see a ministry called Nothing Hidden Ministries. There were so many reminders that God used me was using to just prep my heart for being willing to be vulnerable. Yeah. Under obedience to him. So it took about six months. Finally, July the 8th. Mm -hmm. One day after her birthday, maybe not good timing, but when is this ever a good timing to talk about this? Right, right. In 2016, I put the kids to bed and I knew that that was going to be the time that I that I was going to tell her. Mm -hmm. and I remember putting the kids to bed and everything was great. We had a good night. We went on a date that night and um, got home. We were watching, a, I think we we're watching a Hallmark Christmas movie, actually, because it was Christmas <laughs> in July. Yes. <laughs> so, but I went back to our bedroom and I knew I was about to tell her and I just said, God, there's no way I could do this. How can I do this, God? Because it feels like I'm about to take a knife and just stab in my wife's heart. How can I do this? Mm. And I still remember it so clearly. Brian, just do what I'm telling you to do. Wow. Try to do with the outcome. So I did. I went to Wendy and I said, I need to talk. And um, I told her everything. Mm -hmm. I told her everything, every way I'd felt, everything I'd ever done. There's so many details and things like that. But I, I spilled every single thing uh, over a period of a few hours that night. Mm -hmm. And it was the hardest night of our entire life. Mm -hmm. But I remember so vividly when I got done telling her, I said, Wendy, I said, I'll understand if you want me to leave this family and never come back again. But Wendy came to me and she, she hugged me really big and she said, Brian, I love you and I don't want you to leave. Somehow, some way we're gonna work this out. Mm -hmm. So long story short, over the next few days, it's like God just really, the, the days were, it was, try to figure out a way to breed kind of days. Right, uh, right. Kind of days. But we knew that we needed more people in our life. And so we we talked to her mom and dad. We ended up talking to our pastor and his wife. And and then another pastor, uh, Pastor Ed Litton, we we felt like he might know what to tell us to do. Because really nobody had a good answer. Like, they what, what do you do? Us, but but they loved us and, and, and accepted us and supported us. And that was so good. But Nobody knew what to really tell us quite what to do. Right. But Pastor Ed referred us to a, a counselor named Julie Dozier out in Texas. And a few days later, we were on a plane out to see her. Went through six days of very intensive counseling where we, uh, Julie was so good because she helped kind of pull the layers of the onion and, and really helped us through the crisis. Yes. Moment. But after, so in the, it was, Wonderful, hard, I mean, every kind of range of emotion you could possibly imagine. But we got back home and as life began to settle down back to a new normal, if right. you know, we, we really began feeling like that one day we're going to share this story. Mm -hmm. um, that even that wasn't the time, but even still in the midst of our, our trauma, we felt like, wow, there's there's value. I would have loved to have heard someone share the story and, and help see that there is hope, that there's a different way that this kind of story doesn't always have to end in a divorce and a destruction of the family and going and just living life. However, that there is a different way. I wish that I'd have heard that. And so- yeah felt like that there's value in one day telling the story. The thought of it was grueling, but we knew one day it would eventually happen. And there's so much more. I want to give Wendy kind of an opportunity to tell from her perspective. Yeah. What it was like to hear her husband talk about those things. But we hope that out of our sharing this, that people, I mean, I hope that someone's seeing this, uh, this message right now, even that's in this kind of situation, you can see that there is hope. And then you're not alone and uh, opening up and sharing doesn't mean that everything goes away and everything's perfect. I, right. I, I can't give the testimony that probably a, a lot of people love me to say of I was obedient to God 
and I opened up and shared with my wife. And all of a sudden, I'm no longer attracted to guys. And I have this wonderful attraction and everything's perfect in life. I wish I could give that testimony, but I can't. But I can tell you that it was so worth it opening up and sharing. And life is way different. And there is hope. And we have an incredible marriage now. It's not perfect. Right. There's been so many good things that happened. I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Yeah. Have to let her share. Yes. So, but. All right, Wendy. <laughs> I'm a little more emotional than him. He's had a lifetime to deal with this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and what he's saying is true. From the very beginning, even in the center of our crisis, mm -hmm. I knew as well as he did that one day God was going to get us to this point. Wow. And he was going to use our pain. Yeah. To reach out and love hurting people. Yes. My part in this, obviously, is to support and love my husband. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord with all of my heart. Yes. But also to give hope to the spouse. Mm -hmm. To encourage them to not walk away. To yeah. turn yourself into the Lord 100%. Because we can't do this life without the Lord. Right. He our hope and he is our strength. That's right. When Brian first told me, <laughs> literally, I didn't know how to process it. It, it took me some time. Mm -hmm. to, he had been married for 11 years at this point. Right. And, um, you know, there's just so many questions that pop in your head. I, I was raised in just like him and a good little Christian family. And this was all totally new to me. And I didn't really know how to respond. But all I could think in my mind and in my heart at that moment was, Jesus forgave me of my sins. Who am I to not forgive somebody that's coming broken? Wow. He could have lived that life of secret and sin and acted out and, and, and become a horrible person and been caught right. to humble himself and say, look, this is what I'm dealing with. Yeah. I'm my Lord and I don't want it. Yeah. And I walk away from someone broken asking for help. Right. Do I want the Lord doesn't do that for us? If we come to him broken, he opens his arms out and he loves us. That's right. I care about souls. I care about hurting spouses. Yes. I don't understand it all. Another part of our ministry is we believe the Lord is going to use us to help the church. Yes. So I didn't understand, and I know all the people that I love in our community don't understand. I don't blame our churches for not knowing how to help us. Mm. That's not their calling. The Lord is calling us. Mm. We have all the answers. Mm. I want to learn. Right before we got on this call, I was reading in Matthew and thinking about when Jesus called the first disciples. Mm. Simon and Andrew were fishermen. And the Lord just said, come follow me and I'll teach you how to be fishermen of men. Mm -hmm. I have to know all the answers. I just have to be obedient and say, Lord, here I am. Yeah. Broken. I love you. I trust you. And I know who's going to show us every day what we are to do. And mm -hmm. if he wants the whole picture now, I don't know that I'd be able to handle it. <laughs> yeah. Just today, I'm saying, okay, Lord, here I am. That's mm -hmm. what we are doing. We don't want another Brian to be sitting, especially in our world now, in this coronavirus, trapped in their home. Hope right. is up. There is hope, but we need community. Yes. Not yeah. only do we need the counselors that we are so grateful for, but the community is more where our heart is. Mm -hmm. Saying, you know, I don't have the answers, but I'm here. I love you. Be mm -hmm. able to walk with them, encourage each other, because that's what we needed. Yes. We desperately need it. We already love the Lord. We trust him. But yeah. we need that fleshly person beside us to walk alongside with us. Mm -hmm. We want to be that for other people. Yeah. Wendy, can I ask you, going back to the night, and, and, and I thought y'all be so beautifully put that there is crisis around the time when truth comes to light. There is crisis. And it feels like days of crisis. And I think, Brian, you said it, you're just trying to breathe in those days. And, and I think that's a good thing to point out to people. 
when things like this come up, when we're finally finally allow the light, um, allow the things that we've been keeping in the dark to come to light, there is going to be a season of crisis. Yes. And um, and so how can y'all tell me um, or Wendy, how did you feel? How did you start processing this? What as a wife um, I wanted to ask you about, did you have to deal with like internalized lies? Um, I just feel like when crisis hits so often, Satan uses that as an opportunity to just like slam the lies in. But I love that y'all said, even in the midst of this, we knew that the Lord was going to be using this. But I, I did want to get real with you, Wendy, about for the wives that of how, what, what kind of process went through your mind? What lies were you dealing with? What did you have to deal with from the wife side? Daily, daily battle. Daily. Because my own personal story is a battle of weight and feeling that I'm not pretty since mm -hmm. I was a little girl. Wow. Mm hmm just always wanting to be loved and desired. Yes. My dream, I wanted to be a wife. That's all I ever wanted to be was a wife mm -hmm. and a mother. Mm -hmm. And I finally found the man that I loved that loved me. Yes. So for all these years. <laughs> yeah. To hear this story, it was devastating to me in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Because I already struggled with not feeling pretty. Yeah. And that is a lie from the enemy. God created me. I am beautiful in his sight. Amen. To that wife that's sitting out there now watching this video. Yes. You are beautiful because of God, who God says you are. That's right. Not about how you appear to someone else. Yes. I know that the enemy uses those lies to stop us from reaching out or to just focus on ourselves. Mm -hmm. I walked through, I helped him in the beginning because it was all about helping him. Yeah. After a time, about two years into it, I entered depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I felt defeated. I felt like he got to come out and I had to go in. And I was so afraid of what all of my family and my friends mm -hmm. would do us and how we would be treated. Yes. Because I thought of myself before I knew of all of this. I'm going to confess, I would be the one that would take my children and run and hide and try to protect them. Right. I'm wrong. That's that's not what it's like. That's where the education needs to come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you say education, Wendy, what, or, and Wendy or Brian, this would be both of you, how can you help the church, help us grow that have not walked where you've walked, what would you say are ways we could grow and walk in education? I, I think some, some key things, and this has been kind of echoed through the years of different friends that have loved us and walked through. Mm -hmm. I think people, because so many people don't understand, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't, they've never struck, struggled like this. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what it's like to be attracted to the same sex. So I think some people have made, they make some assumptions like they assume, okay, if someone is gay or mm -hmm. sex attracted, homosexual, whatever, however you want to term, you know, whatever term you want to use, mm -hmm. they're a different kind of person. They're not even a normal human being. Mm -hmm. That sometimes is the assumption, right? Like dehumanized or, well, I need to, I need to watch my kids around that person. Right. They might be, you know, there's there people yeah. just make assumptions that because a person struggles like this, well, they just aren't a normal human. And that's simply not true. Mm. I think that's one thing that I would say that uh, everybody needs to realize is that we all, all human beings, mm -hmm. we're born into a world that is broken. Mm -hmm. And we all have a something. Yes. And and it seems like to me that growing up in the church, it was like when you talk about sins, there mm -hmm. were some sins that kind of fit into this box. It's called like the acceptable kind of sin. That's you right. Know, you struggle with gossip or 
if you're a teenage boy and you're kind of lusting after the girls and, you know, or even a married man, you see the other women on the beach and your mind goes crazy. Well, that's normal. That's acceptable. Or yeah. there, there's the things that we kind of put in this box that's acceptable kind of stuff. But if it's in this other box over here, whew, you're going to hell. You're straight to hell. You know, it's yeah. that categorization of this sin is an OK kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You can talk about this and, and talk about that you struggle with this and it's OK. Versus if you struggle with this, people start questioning your salvation. And so, and even in a conversation we had last night with a couple of friends of ours, that same situation as ours, mm -hmm. he, the guy said, he said, you know, I was, I struggled with this and I was choosing not, I, I knew that wasn't the direction I wanted to go in my life. And I actually went and took a long time for him to work up the courage, but he went and talked with his youth pastor and it wasn't well received. He was treated questioning like his salvation. questioning your salvation. Well, how can you be saved and, and be tempted this way? How can you even be a Christian? He wasn't very well received. And I have heard so many stories like that, which I don't believe represents most of the church. Right. I really don't. Right. But there are some people that have really put a very bad name to, to the church because yeah. they've, they've questioned people and isolated and ostracized people. Um, there's some statistics, a, a guy I've heard, he, he's done a lot of work just talking with, with people in, uh, that are gay. And he said approximately based on his stats, I don't know where all the numbers came from, but he said about 83% of people that are what we call in the gay community were born and raised in church. Wow. They left by the time they were 18 years old on average, but most of them, based on what he, he, the discussions he had, most of them didn't leave the church because of the theology of the church. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, you know, the church believes that homosexuality is, is, is sin. They right. didn't leave because of that. They left because of the way they were treated and the mm -hmm. way they saw other people treated. Right. This day and age, to be honest, the the world people in the quote unquote the gay community which i i hate to even use that word because they're still they're people we're talking right. about people here it's relationships right. with people but they love and accept and embrace people mm -hmm. like the church should be doing mm. I think that's what i would say that i wish more as a church as people in the church the church which i love the church i wish we could do more of is to love and treat people like people, mm -hmm. like some other weird dehumanized human being. Everybody wants to be treated like a, a person, regardless yeah. of what, what they struggle with. We, I wish our churches were more conducive for people being able to come and say, this is what I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Church was simply love. Well, and I think you're hitting on a really important point, Brian, is that one is we need to let down the shock value. Um, as when I've had women come and say, hey, my husband is dealing with same-sex attraction. I think that we've got to get over the, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Like that is not godly. Um, Christ did not have people coming up to him and their brokenness and him putting his hands out and going, okay, that's, mm, that's a little much for me. And, and if we really want to be Christ-like in the church, he was the only people he actually said, you're too much for me or you're too extra were the religious people or the people that were so religious, they couldn't see him. They couldn't identify the Messiah. And so the, the one thing I'm really hearing from you is saying when someone comes with this conversation, if we can't have a place in the church for the broken, then what are we doing? We're sending them to the world and saying, go find yourself out there. Go figure your issue out in the world. Yeah. And we, the church, do not believe truth is out there. We believe it's inside. The yeah. truth is in the church with the gospel. And yet we're saying the gospel can't handle certain sins. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think back even as a, a 16 year old boy, mm -hmm. wow, what a difference it could have made in my life. And I'm not, I, I, I can't just blame everybody else. I, yeah, I, yeah. Like, I made a choice not to say and open up. Mm -hmm. Most people could probably understand why, but mm -hmm. 
what kind of difference would it have made if I had been raised in a, in a church in an environment where it was okay to not be okay. You know, it was okay to talk about anything and everything you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. We want you to open up and talk about it. Here's somebody you can confide in and they're going to love you and they're going to accept you and embrace you. Sometimes we get word of that. We get scared of that word acceptance because we think that that means, well, if I say I accept you, it means that I condone, you know, what you're doing. That's right. People just want to be loved and accepted. But what if I'd have been raised in that kind of environment where it was easy to talk about things that are really hard to talk about? And I knew that people were going to join me and walk with me and uh, walk this out with me. It could have made a big difference. Or what if before I got married, it 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 could have made such a difference and avoided so much pain. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that I wouldn't still have struggles. Right. The point is, is when you feel like you're not alone in something, when you know yeah. you're not alone, it's you know so you're sad. you're connected and in community, which is what the church is supposed to be, mm-hmm. is that that's my family. Yes. You're not alone in this. And this, all the people struggle and we're going to walk this out together because we want to live a life that pleases and honors the Lord. Mm -hmm. If people feel like they can be vulnerable with that and open with that and authentic on the way life really is and not have to wear this mask every Sunday to come to church, it can make a difference in people's lives. And that's what I want to see churches be. And that's what we want to create. I I want people to know, hey, if you don't have a friend in the world, you can come talk to me and you can come talk to Wendy. But there's other people you can talk to. We want to create this environment where it's conducive for people. We can do just that. Yeah. Yeah. And and do you all think that some of that fear has been born out of, we, we seem to in the church really have only two stances when dealing with this type, we, you know, we talk about like this type of sin, like homosexuality or same sex attraction. We seem to either be on polarized opposites that you get one side of the church that defines the theology by it is sin. And we're agreeing here that homosexuality or same sex attraction is sin but we are agreeing that we are sinners all in need of the Lord. So you get this one side that's like, it is sin, the end, there's no help for you, go away from us, right? And then you get the opposite side of the polarization, which has changed to, it is not sin. And so you get these two extremes. And I think that churches so often get afraid of falling into, well, if we're accepting people, then we're saying it's not a sin. Or if you know the opposite side. So um, can you speak into that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think that's that's such a good point because it is so polar opposite. It's like the the only options right now to people is mm-hmm. it's sin, 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 and you can't even fit in in this place. Or right. you can go to another church that has now has accepted it and condoned it and said, that is the way God wants you to live. But it's never talked about that. You know what? You're struggling that way. That's what you're tempted with. Hey, Wendy's tempted with things. We're all tempted with things. Yes. It's about choosing to live a life that honors God. And are we always going to be perfect? No. Something I want to point out with this that I think is important to clarify is because terminology is. This is the education part. Terminology (laughs) is everything in this. It's so big because like the word gay. Mm hmm. That can be interpreted so many different ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, what it really means is it refers to the, the word homosexual. And what homosexual means, it describes a person who is sexually attracted to people of the same sex. Hence it's the not, homo part. Yeah. Homos- it's, not conducive, it's not saying that. It, I mean, by the Latin, that's what I'm referring to, like where it came from. <laughs> it's not indicative of behaviors. It's not indicative of a lifestyle or even an identity. It just simply describes this is a person who is sexually attracted to people of the same sex, whereas it's the exact opposite of heterosexual people are attracted to the opposite sex. And the street term for that is straight. So everybody understands that if if uh, somebody said I'm straight, people understand that's what that means. And they know they're not talking about an identity or anything like that. Whereas if somebody says I'm gay, that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, just for the pure definition or, oh, I'm someone marching in a gay pride parade with feathers up and down my bag. I mean, it gets so interpreted. Mm-hmm. 
the point is what I want to say in this is it's like if we take a, a heterosexual, a straight male married man walks into a restaurant and sees a woman sitting across the, the, the restaurant that's very attractive to him. Mm -hmm. She's attractive to him. He doesn't decide whether or not she's attractive. She simply is. Mm -hmm. So, and he may be tempted to lust after her, like think mm -hmm. sexual thoughts, which we would say that's a sin to actually mm -hmm. lust after her. But right. the attraction itself, it, it, he didn't choose. He's not doing anything wrong simply because she's pretty to him. Right. It's when he engages in the, the sexual lustful thoughts. That's when it becomes sin. Mm -hmm. It is the same situation for someone who is homosexual mm -hmm. uh, walking into a restaurant, seeing another guy that's attractive, doesn't decide whether or not he's attractive or not. It just, it just is that guy or woman can choose whether or not he or she lusts. It's, it's true. We can choose what we do with it, but we don't choose the attraction. And I think the key distinguishing people that don't understand assume that if someone even has those temptations, that they're always living in a state of sin. Mm. That's not true. Mm. We we decide what we do with temptations, but being tempted by something is not the sin it. itself. It's what I right. do with that. It's That's what I mean by education. That I make. Yeah. We yeah. start talking about this because it blew my mind. But the mm -hmm. more he talks and explains, it helps me to understand. Mm -hmm. So as far as the church goes, we need to have the groups where we start getting uncomfortable and talking about this. Mm. And both sides of it because that makes sense to me when he explains it like that but i didn't see it in, in, at first you know i mean yeah. oh we, yeah we, that's what i mean by education just actually having conversations and yeah. talking with somebody who's living it or has lived it and yeah. just getting uncomfortable because having a group meeting inside the church talking about something like this is extremely uncomfortable mm -hmm. but we have to yeah. how are we going to how are we going to reach people if we don't even understand what we're talking about Yes. Well, and I think what y'all are bringing up is extremely biblical. Jesus talked about the difference between lust and temptation because mm -hmm. um, he he was like, hey, if you lust after a woman, just the idea of that, that is sin when you move into lust. Right. But Jesus was tempted in every way. Absolutely. I just mm -hmm. read that Matthew right before we started. And, and I think even when we read that, we can disconnect what every way means. Because there are things that I am sure you and I right now would think there is no way that ever crossed Jesus's mind. He's too, he was too, but he tabernacled with man. He came to be with man and was tempted in every way. And so the temptation is not sin. And um, to testify to that, Corey Ten Boom um, wrote a wonderful book um, where she calls herself the tramp for the Lord. She went all over the world. And she talks about a woman who had been a prostitute and had been set free from that. And she had dreams over and over that were very vivid dreams. And she was like, these need to go. I'm still really stuck in this. I'm still, but, and Corey Ten Boone ends up asking her, are you walking this out? No, I'm, I am, I am walking. I am choosing obedience in my life. And she, she prays with her for the dreams to end. But she says, if you hit a really large bell, and it vibrates, boom, 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 boom. The 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 vibration of it is is got is happens long after the issue, right, has been um, dealt with. And so I think that that's a great point that Brian's making because it is not that you're going to talk about same sex re, um, attraction; it's just going to go away, and you're never going to think about it again. But I think it's so important this conversation of saying. Just because the bell was hit, it might ricochet. And it doesn't mean that because you've gotten a ricocheting moment when you walked into Walmart or something happened, that now you have to go back into shame, that you have to go back into self-hatred and depression. Because that's really important to point out that that's what Satan wants. Absolutely. And not only just with same-sex um, attraction, with anything. When you've been set free and you're walking in freedom, the Lord just says, don't return to slavery. He's not saying you're never going to deal with this issue again. Right, yeah. Yeah, so good. You know, um, I, I want to be careful also to point out that this isn't the only, I mean, everybody has a something and it's hard right. for people. Um, the natural human reaction is to hide. Hmm. I mean, think about what happened with Adam and Eve. 
That's well, right. The thing they did yeah. after they sinned Say they hi. Yeah. because of shame. And so that that seems to come natural for most people when we have anything in our life. I mean, there's a lot of things that everybody deals with that are not easy to talk about. But it's I've heard Joyce Meyer. She said said something. And I love this. She said it's our secrets that make us sick. Mm. And I love that because it's wow. so true. It's living in the secret. That's where shame can really thrive. And 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 things get bigger and bigger and bigger in those dark places of the secret world. So if we can walk in obedience to here's a page that most people tear out of their Bible. It's the page that has James 516 on it. Mm. Confess your sins to one another. Right. And, and so, that so that you may be healed. Well, I, I had read that for years before I opened up. And I remember thinking, oh, well, I've confessed my sins to, to Jesus. And so right. I'm, I know that I'm, I'm saved. But, but that says confess it to one another. But right. that wasn't about salvation. It was about healing. Right. But so often we don't do that as Christians. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about these things, but it's really, really important that we do. And life is so much better. It doesn't make all the problems go away. But wow. Yeah. Life is so much better when you don't have to walk around in shame and secrecy. Right. Those these things. Well, Brian, I want to ask you another question because your story is, is remarkable because you're still married. Oh yeah. And happy. <laughs> and happy. We're grateful. We we're blessed. I see that picture behind Wendy of the two of you and then behind Brian of your beautiful boys. Yeah. And so Brian, what would you give advice to the husband that's thinking the only way for me to be happy is to leave? Mm -hmm. Um what what are your thoughts on this because you're choosing to stay married and to and to have a wonderful, blessed marriage. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, I would say to those out there that may be hearing this and maybe that that didn't happen for you. Um, I don't want you to feel bad or upset because sometimes things don't happen. And even to a wife, you know, sometimes uh, if she finds out something about her husband, it's very, very it's a very difficult thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I have a, an empathy toward anybody, no matter what choice you ended up making. But what I would say to um, the husband, mm -hmm. and this is, and I think Wendy can chime in here too, is that if you're listening to this and you feel like, well, there's no way I can ever tell my wife uh, because she's going to leave me. And I don't want that to happen because I love her. I would say, I can't promise you she won't. And that's a hard thing to, 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 to hear, but I can tell you and, and I can promise you that it is better to be real and open and authentic mm -hmm. than to live the rest of your life in secret. Mm -hmm. uh, because most, most likely what's going to end up playing here, here's the way this story plays out so often. Mm -hmm. And our counselor confirmed that most of the time, a spouse in our situation, a, a lot of times what happens is they end up, they're acting out, they're doing things and they get caught. Mm. A spouse catches them in something. And that is incredibly, incredibly detrimental. Right. So I think it made a difference in our marriage Jeez. and the sustainability of our marriage because God was working on my heart to be willing to open up to Wendy versus her finding out something about right. me. Uh, I willingly chose to come to her. Now I'm not perfect. I'm not, not saying that at all, but right. I have the choice to be willing to open up and, and talk to her and confess to her. And I told her everything. And I think that made a very big difference. And our counselor said, she almost never sees that most of the time it's somebody's gotten caught. And so, <laughs> If if a if a man or a woman can is willing to open up and confess it and talk about it, the chances of a marriage thriving after that are much higher mm -hmm. than if if not and it ends up getting. Caught. I have to so, say that that's actually tremendous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I both are in secret Facebook groups because that's the only groups that we have available. But in my right. wife's group, I hear it all the time. If and I, I am so proud of Brian. It makes all the difference in the world, your attitude. Mm -hmm. If you 
you go broken to your spouse, mm -hmm. that's what you're struggling with. And you're asking for help, seeking help, willing to do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. Have a much or he is going to have a much better job receiving that and wanting to work through it. Mm -hmm. If you are not and you're cocky and you're arrogant and you do your own thing and you're not repentive, it's going to be real hard for that spouse to want to walk through something that's already extremely painful and difficult to do. Right now, we both madly love the Lord and love yeah. each other. We're willing to do whatever. Yeah. But if it's not that whoever the person is that's struggling mm -hmm. has to get to the point where they're ready to say, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. but hear wives all the time that still don't trust their spouse because they keep hiding yeah. to do whatever that they're doing wrong. And they're destroying that wife and destroying yeah. that family. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely painful to sit and watch because I know how hard it is without that going on. Right. So I would say to whoever's struggling, man, <laughs> it is so worth it. Mm -hmm. You humble yourself yeah. and go to them first. Mm. Broken. Lose the attitude. Lose the cockiness. Right. Being vulnerable. My daddy has always said, when we open our hearts, other hearts are open. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. Mm. Brian, um, we had talked earlier a little bit, um, Christopher Yawn, which I highly recommend anyone listening to this to grab his book on holy sexuality. Um, he actually um, lived a um, homosexual lifestyle for many years and then came to Jesus and he is not married. And he, he really just talks about, he's a professor at Moody um, Seminary and he has some wonderful thoughts, but he has kind of coined a term called holy sexuality. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask y'all about this, um, that his point is in the church, we've put too much emphasis on just be a heterosexual, right? Yeah. Like you were talking about the difference in the, in the Latin of the hetero versus the homo, you know, those words like, like something different than you. And um, instead of being a homosexual. And he points out that actually there's a lot of brokenness in heterosexuality as yeah. much as yeah. God does not love that is called sin, right? Like yeah. it, and um, when you look at even Proverbs and God addresses the, the things he hates, right? It's conditions of the heart. It's the things that lead you to these sins. Yeah. And so um, how does ho um, holy sexuality the choice, I guess I'm getting to that you decide, hey, uh, even though I'm tempted in these ways, the woman next to me is who I made a covenant with. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us just a little bit about our culture tells you if it doesn't make you happy and it's it's not what you want, then walk away. But you're really, how does it literally look applicably daily for you to choose holy sexuality versus just how you feel? If, if, does that make sense? Close yes. the blind. Hang on, let me close. Yes, okay. close the blind. <laughs> we got the sun moving. Okay. Yeah, totally does make sense. And you know, I, I I do I see what you're saying. A lot of times, it's like in someone like my situation, a lot of people would say, and even myself mm -hmm. would feel like the goal here is to be heterosexual. Okay. Not mm -hmm. attracted to the same sex. And attracted. That's the ultimate epitome, and that's what probably most uh, most people that are homosexual. That's like their life dream. I just wish I could be like you know yeah. everybody else. The goal as a Christian is to be holy. I, I want to strive to be holy, and of course, in and of myself, I can't do that. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's my acceptance of of His gift. He He makes me righteous. But it so it is not a a heterosexuality is not the goal of life. I mean, God right. wants us to be holy. And just as I could go sin homosexually, a mm -hmm. heterosexual man can go do the same. That's right. Sometimes I think we think of that as as long as it fit, it goes back to that acceptable box. As long as it's within this acceptable quote unquote normal box, it's right. okay. You know, if a uh, a married man is lusting after another woman that's not his wife. Oh, well, that's just, he's just being a normal guy. Yeah. That's normal and acceptable. Right. No, God wants our mind to be pure. No, yeah. we're going to mess up sometimes, 
but our our striving and our goal should be holiness and and uh, and so it's not all about a making myself from it's not all about homosexual to heterosexual that's not the goal it, it's uh it's holiness and i think the what people should also understand is that there are people that struggle with homosexuality and they never get married and and they never develop any kind of attraction to the opposite sex and so for them they're gonna you know they make a choice i'm not gonna go walk that out i'm not gonna go live that way but they don't have any desire for people of the opposite sex so i think it's important that the church be the family amen because you're talking about a man or a woman that they're making a choice to live their life in a way that they believe pleases and honors God. They need family. All of us do. I, and they need a place to be single in the church. Yeah. <laughs> and not feel like the odd man out all the time. Absolutely. Paul says being single is a gift. It's a I, gift. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like in the church. It's like the ultimate goal of life is to get married and have kids. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But, there and even the Bible, Paul talks about how good it is to not get married. Yes, nobody says if you're gonna burn with lust, all that get married. But <laughs> sometimes we we tend to think that the epitome of life is to get married and have kids and have a family. But there is something to something said of being single. Amen. So I think it's important that that would be another thing I would say to the church is be the family. Yes. And Invite people over for dinner. Let them be connected in community. Nobody wants to be alone, even if they're single. That's I'm right. I'm so blessed that I have a family and a wife and two kids. But there's not everybody gets that. And so that's why you're hitting on an important kind of lie. I do think the enemy has planted is that if you get married, then you'll never be lonely. But there are a lot of very lonely people in marriages, right? Yeah. And so I think yeah. the church has to make a place, as you're saying, to be the family and to invite singles. And in that if if you have, by the Lord, given this gift of being single, then there's great purpose in your life. Yeah. And that our sexuality is not eternal. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, that what you're saying is that our holiness, what we're we are working towards the next door that's opening is we're all going to be with the father and our sexuality is not going to be what determined us. But the world has told people your identity is in your sexual sexuality. And the yeah. church has got to get to a place where we're having these conversations and saying your identity is in Christ. That's in right. Christ alone. And we all struggle but your identity in the end is in Christ alone. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, and I was going to read this verse um, to kind of close us out and everything, but, um, and, and I'll tell you why I'm reading this. Um, First Corinthians six, nine is where Paul writes about homosexuality, but I think it's so filled with hope and so true to our conversation because he says here, or do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, neither idolaters, neither adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the rivalries, nor the swindlers. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. And all of you, and some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. I think it's so important that when we speak with you, Brian, and with you, Wendy, and you're so brave for the church, I feel like y'all are people like pioneers for the church. And I'm honored. You are. And I'm honored to be your friend because the strength of Christ in you literally is the anointing. It just flows from your family. And you're trying to tell this verse from Paul that like, this is all of us. Yes. If I wanted to write my name on one of those, it would be all of them. And he's saying, all of you were in this and all of you have been needing to be washed. All of you have been needing to be sanctified. And so I just appreciate that y'all are being so bold in Christ to say, this is my walk with the father. And he is making us holy day by day, just like he's making you holy day by day. Yes. So I just appreciate y'all. And I hope that we can have more conversations. I'd love to plug back in with y'all maybe in a few months. Definitely, definitely. Can I say one thing before we go? Yeah. I want to speak once again to 
anybody watching this that's in my situation or in Wendy's situation, I don't care if you're 13 years old or 25, you're married, you're single, <laughs> no matter who you are, I, I just want to tell you that you're not alone. Amen. No matter what you struggle with, no matter how hard it is, or no matter how ugly it may feel to you, you're not alone. I want you to know that. I want you to, to really feel that. And I want you to know that you're loved unconditionally, mm -hmm. that not only does God love you unconditionally, yeah. but so do we. And I hope and, and I, I challenge you uh, to be willing to, to come and talk to somebody. If you don't have a somebody, look me and Wendy up. Mm -hmm. Look us up on Facebook, Ryan Ferguson. You can contact Julia and she can get you in touch. I'd love to talk with you. Wendy would love to talk with you because we want you to know that no matter how ugly it is, you're loved and we will accept you and we will walk this journey out with you. We need people in our life. We're blessed. We have wonderful friends and family that have loved us through it, but we always want more. And so I just want to encourage you right now that there's hope and, uh, and life can't promise you. It's all going to be rosy. Jesus never promised us that. Paul, I, I'll say this, the last thing I remember, Paul had the thorn in his flesh. Mm -hmm. and I'm kind of glad that we don't know what that is. It, nobody knows what it is because we can kind of fill in the blanks a little bit. And I'm going to fill in the blanks with what it is. What we know, though, is it was something that he struggled with. It didn't come from God. It was a messenger of Satan is what he called, referred to it as. And it was uncomfortable for him. And he prayed and prayed and prayed that God would take it away. But you know what Jesus said to him? He, he didn't say, oh, I'm going to remove this thorn from your flesh and everything's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. He didn't remove it. But what he did say is, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amen. So I just want to encourage all of you, uh, be willing to open up because you are loved. So thank you, Julia, so much for giving yes, us this opportunity. So We're grateful. Yeah, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Wendy. And um, we are continuing to stand with you and pray with you and learn from you. So we appreciate you. And thank you for hope. That's what you're leaving us with. And that's the message of Calvary, that no matter what, you can come to him. So much joy in our life. It is not yeah. all sad and hard. Yeah, it really is. Yes. I mean, so much more. I mean, we forget when we first start talking about this, that it all sounds so gloom and doom, but... We are truly happy. We I know, I've people. never seen so many pictures of warm coffee cups. And and y'all oh, love cold weather. Living in Alabama, y'all love cold weather and blankets and coffee cups. I love your pictures. We love people and we love each other. And yeah. you could be happy too. Yes. Amen. Thank y'all so much. And we are going to check back in with y'all. So thank you for sharing your story.